Normally, being a little extra might be a bit much, but not when it comes to healthcare. That's why United Healthcare's Health Protector Guard fixed indemnity insurance plans, underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, supplement your primary plan so you manage out of pocket costs. Learn more at uh1.com. This is Paige, the co host of Giggly Squad, and I want to tell you about a company that I've been loving Olive and June. Olive and June gives you everything that you need for a salon quality manicure in one box. And if you break it down, it really comes out to $2 a manicure, which is absolutely insane. It's also so easy to get salon worthy nails at home with Olive and June. The difference between how your nails used to look when you did them yourself and now with the Manny system is a complete game changer. The best thing about Olive and June too is it's a quick dry. It dries in about one minute, lasts for five days, and full coverage in up to one to two coats. Visit oliveandjune.com slash perfect Manny 20 for 20% off your first system. That's oliveandjune.com slash perfect Manny 20 for 20% off your first system. There's never been a faster or easier way to start your weight loss journey than with Plush Care. Plush Care accepts most insurance plans and gives you online access to board certified physicians who can prescribe FDA approved weight loss medications like Wigovi and ZepBound for those who qualify. Take charge of your health and speak with a board certified physician about a weight loss plan that's right for you. Get started today at plushcare.com slash weight loss. That's plushcare.com slash weight loss. Plushcare.com slash weight loss. Welcome to the Mighty Eights Podcast, the podcast about the people, planes and the places of the United States 8th Army Air Force during World War II, with me, Johan Tasker, and military historian Mike Peters. In this episode, we're at Lavenham Airfield in Suffolk in the east of England, Station 137, and home to the 487th Bomb Group. We're here to talk about the biggest mission ever mounted by the Mighty Eights Air Force. Mike, this was one of the most important air battles of World War II, but it doesn't always get the attention it deserves. No, Johan, it it certainly features prominently in American understanding of World War II, but um, we in the UK tend to talk about the Battle of the Bulge, and um, most people on both sides of the Atlantic tend to focus on the ground fighting around uh, the Ardennes Offensive, or the Battle of the Bulge, as people call it. So here today we're going to talk about the equally important air component of that and the role played by the US Army 8th Air Force. So we called this episode Everything That Will Fly and this was what's known as a maximum effort mission on the 24th of December 1944. Everything That Can Fly, Maximum Effort, Mission 760, the biggest raid of the war. Yeah, that's correct. And the reason it's uh, such a big, massive effort is because the Germans have, have pulled a pulled a fast one. They've they've mounted a very successful um, surprise attack in the Ardennes and in the board, where the borders of Luxembourg, Belgium, and Germany all join, uh, and completely unexpected and uh, massed in secrecy and security, uh, planned intimately by the German general staff, very small staff around Hitler himself, and it really is uh, one last throw of the dice for the Germans. And, and Hitler has deluded himself into thinking that. Because they succeeded here in 1940 in, in the Ardennes, they can do the same thing again. And, and he's corralled what's left of German resources in tanks and fuel and infantry and vehicles and artillery and aircraft into this this uh, idea that he can drive out of the Ardennes with complete surprise, drive straight across the Low Countries, seize the vital port of Antwerp where uh, most Allied supply, combat supplies are arriving into into Europe from, and in in so doing, knock out the port, but also split the uh, British Canadian armies from the American armies, and therefore deal with the separated Allied armies piecemeal. That's what he thinks he's going to do. And he does that under a, a shroud of secrecy and security because he's paranoid about the, the Allies finding out, but also because 
in July '44. The Stauffenberg plot nearly killed him, uh, and uh, he's he's determined that uh, nobody will leak information. And during the planning of this uh, uh, ill-fated attack. Uh, all transmissions uh, of orders are done by hand by dispatch rider, which you, who are closely escorted and followed around by the SS. Only the most small number of senior officers know about the plan, to the degree that even on the morning of the attack, which starts on the 16th of December, one of the divisional commanders, one of the German divisional commanders, only takes over his division that morning and knows nothing about the attack that's going to happen. He arrives in his unit and finds that he's going to war that day. So to put this in context then, this is six months after D-Day. The Allies are in Europe on their way to Berlin. Hitler is trying to knock the Allies out of the war or at least cause them to pause for thought for, for at least some time. Yeah, the writing is on the wall for the, for the, for the Germans and Hitler knows it. Uh, the, the Russians, we all talk about D-Day and Normandy, but the Russians have mounted o- o- Operation Bagration in the July of 1944. Millions of Russian soldiers pouring across the eastern front in towards Berlin under unrelenting pressure on the German army in the east and the in the west British Canadian uh, American armies are pushing forward they've crossed the Seine and at one point we all think the war is going to be over by Christmas 1944 that's not going to happen and Hitler believes that if he can just slow down one front he can just deal with the Russians and that will give him enough time for his new jet fighters his V1s his V2s and his Messerschmitt 163 rocket fighters all these new vengeance weapons to come into play and that will give him breathing space and uh, that he can make the war last another year or two and his secret weapons will come into play and he's deluded himself into believing that. So that's where we are then at uh, at more or less the beginning of December 1944. Hitler's got problems on on two fronts, the East and the West, and this is the Battle of the Bulge, the Ardennes Offensive on the Western Front. The 8th Air Force, Mike, it's come a long way since the early missions of uh, 1942 when it arrived in England. What sort of state is the 8th Air Force in by December 1944? I'd say if, if we really think about it and, and use the December as a, as a yardstick, as you rightly say, December 41, Pearl Harbour. By December 42, Eakers crossed the Atlantic, set up a, 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 an embryonic 8th Air Force headquarters in the spring. First raids in the summer of 40, 42, through to 43... Uh, Schweinfurt, daylight bombing with not enough groups, not enough muscle, not enough combat power. We get into 44, we're ramping up for D-Day for Operation Overlord and the 8th Air Force is gaining strength week by week, more airfields, more bombers, more crews, etc. More technology uh, and certainly by the end of 1944, the, the autumn of 1944, we're talking about the P-51 Mustang, little friends going all the way to the target. Extended range and drop tanks for P-38s, Lightnings and P-47 Thunderbolts. Uh, and nearly almost 40 bomb groups uh, regularly bombing with G, H2S radar and all the other technical aids that they've got. And also, most importantly, collective skill. They've learned how to do what they need to do and how to deal with whether They've got radar, they're bombing through low cloud and overcast. So I would say, actually, the 8th Air Force, capability-wise, in the winter of 1944, is at optimum strength. And the only thing that's really stopping them is the weather. So it's got the technology, it's at the top of its game, it's got these long-range fighter escorts that can look after the heavy bombers all the way into into Germany. It's really literally going places. Yeah, they are. This this is now what the the, the vision was at the start, what you could... Doolittle and Spatz and Hap, Hap Arnold wanted. This is what they they, they envisaged the Eighth Air, Force, Eighth Air Force would be doing. The sad thing is for them is that although they're still doing precision bombing and they're bombing industry, they're bombing oil, they're going after transport rail rail heads and things like that. As the autumn closes in, less daylight, poorer weather, and it all starts to slow down. And and if we look at um, December 1944, they are they are back after after Normandy in the summer. They're back to hitting rail junctions, they're back to hitting all refineries to the point that the Germans are producing only 30% of the fuel they actually need. Although it has to be said that the German Luftwaffe is, has gained in strength, ironically, and, and it, although it hasn't got the fuel or the trained pilots, they're producing more and more aircraft. Albert Speer's taken over the industry, Goering has allowed him to get, get involved with doing that properly, and uh, German fighter strength is increasing. 
So a little bit more detail then about December 1944. What is the fascination about the Ardennes for Hitler? So we're looking at the junctions of the borders of Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany and a little bit of the French border. And it's, it's heavily forested. And in 1940, Hitler hides his armoured forces in the Ardennes forest because the Allies in 1940, the French and the British, believe that no way, it's, it's impassable to tanks, and it pretty much is. And they get away with it because there's poor air reconnaissance and the Royal Air Force and the French Air Force don't understand what they need to do and don't, don't see these hidden forces. So when German light tanks, and that's a key thing, they're much smaller than the 1944 tanks, emerge out of the Ardennes it's a complete surprise and they smash through and the Battle of Sedan happens it, it, it really is a, a key moment in the Blitzkrieg of 1940 Hitler is yearning for that success again and he thinks well it worked once it will work again and you know the, the Allies will not expect us to do this again so even though the roads are poor and it's forested but they, he goes for it again with all his heavy tanks and his armour all the resources he can muster not really understanding that he doesn't have the same advantages as he had be- had before and that the Ardennes is not suitable for what he's trying to do. But he's hanging on thinking, if, if I do this in the depths of the winter, the weather will negate the biggest car that the Allies have to play, which is their air power. The, the Allies pretty much have air superiority most of the time over uh, Western Europe at that time. So he's he really dependent on the weather forecast. He's waiting and waiting for this weather forecast so that he knows that for two or three days, his armour can burst out of the Ardennes and drive for, the, for Antwerp unmolested by overwhelmingly superior Western air power. And like you say, he's going to do this uh, by throwing everything he has at the Allies in secret, everything done by letter, not radio or signal, and, 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 and deception too. Yeah, deception. So he, what is going out on radio, which which uh, the, the Allies are intercepting, is the talk about the watch on the Rhine, the Wacht am Rhein, which is basically a, a defensive posture. That everyone thinks the Germans are going to enter trenches and bunkers for the winter. Christmas is going to be quiet. Although the war is not going to be over by this Christmas, it will be by next Christmas and it's all going to be very quiet. And he deliberately lets that seed be sown. And the Allies, are, let's be honest, the Allies are complacent. They've done so well. And they're, they're tired and exhausted as well. And it's like, OK, let's all settle down for Christmas and, uh, and wait for the snow to clear. So Hitler's waiting to launch this huge, huge attack. What's he waiting for? He's actually waiting for uh, a guy called Professor Werner Schwertweger. Excuse my German pronunciation, if anyone's a German speaker. And uh, he's the senior meteorologist in the, in the OKW, the German headquarters. And every day, Hitler's saying, what's the weather forecast? He wants bad weather. And every day... Uh, Werner Schwartweger says, not yet, not yet. And the reason for not yet is he wants the weather to be as bad as possible because he knows that that is going to give him most protection. Yeah, I mean, this operation is called Operation Autumn Mist and it's not called that for no reason. He wants low cloud, low, low cloud base and ideally fog to to mask the advance of his armoured forces. And up until the 14th of December, he's being told, not yet, not yet. And then on the 14th of December, the message is, Probably, yes. Confirmation tomorrow at noon. So next day on the 15th, he's waiting for the go. And he just needs 24 hours notice to release the, uh, the, the uh, Operation Autumn Mist for the tanks to start rolling, the Panzers to start rolling. Uh, coincidentally, it, we do get some idea of how bad the weather is and that, that fog is there because the 15th of December is the day that Glenn Miller goes missing in his, in his Norseman aircraft flying from England across the English Channel to Paris for a, a concert. And uh, he vanishes into, into fog freezing fog and this is exactly the kind of weather that uh, Hitler wants so on the 16th of December Operation Autumn Mist is launched and the Panzers are released and it is a complete surprise Allied intelligence has not picked this up at all the weather is bad why would anybody attack here why would anyone attack in this weather but no here they come out of the forest of the Ardennes and they're racing through and heading for Antwerp is, is what they're trying to do and German commandos are, are moving around dressed in American uniforms causing panic so the the, the rumour gets out that they're trying to kill Eisenhower so Eisenhower is locked up in his headquarters and the US forces in the area are reeling and are being overrun and pushed back in droves and the numbers are huge aren't they I mean we, we call it the battle of the bulge because it caused this huge huge bulge in the front line yeah, so let's talk about the numbers. So we're talking about a, a quarter of a million German troops. Uh, we're talking about uh, 970 Panzers, 1,900 pieces of artillery, and about 1,000 aircraft are thrown into this uh, this offensive. And we, we call it the bulge because it is a bulge in the line, but Hitler didn't want a bulge. He wanted it to 
burst out and drive across the low countries to Antwerp. So this is just completely out of the blue. Mike, we've heard about what Hitler was trying to achieve. What was the response like? What, what, what was happening at somewhere like Lavenham, where we are today? Once the offensive is launched on the 16th and people become aware of it, there's, there's obviously a need for a maximum firepower. And the, although the Allied tactical air forces are, are, are attriting and, and doing their best to stop the Germans on the front line at a tactical level, what we need to do, or what the Allies need to do, is... Uh, disrupt the supplies, hit railheads, hit bridges, hit hit uh, aircraft factories and airfields, whatever they can, that will take this, the oomph that's behind hit the Ardennes offensive out of it and, and break up any reinforcements and resupply options that the Germans have. Uh, but they just can't get up, because if you're going to mount a maximum effort radar and get across it, you need to be able to take off, which they can't do. Uh, and when you, once you're in the air, before you cross the English coast, you need to be able to formate and get into your combat boxes and into your bomber stream. And that's just not possible. So it's completely frustrating, even though the second division, second bomb division have been stood by because they're radar equipped. Uh, and there are uh, radar and fighter control stations in liberated Netherlands to guide them. They just cannot get off their airfields. And that situation lasts day after day after day not just from the 12th to the 16th, but beyond the 16th, the 16th, the 17th, the 18th, the weather, the 8th Air Force is paralysed. Yeah, simple as. There is no way they can get into the air in any meaningful number. Well, let's leave the airfield for a while and let's go into the village of Lavenham itself and and visit somewhere that was a, a popular place for air crew and ground crew to go when they weren't flying. 
feel the um, emotion and, and ponder who was in the same room during wartime and what they thought, you know, flying tomorrow or the day after, or they just got back from a pretty hairy mission over Bremen or somewhere like that from the 487th. Who knows what, what they thought and who met here. And, of course, the other thing about it, which we, we try and mention a, a lot, is the interaction with the local community. You know, because Lavenham's a small village, still is fairly small. You know, and to have a, a US Army Air Force airfield next door with over 2,000 service personnel on it, and the village is a smaller population than that. The, the crossover is is immense, and it's a huge factor in in the life of the people of Lavenham through the wartime years. So yeah, it's it's at the heart of the village, and it's certainly for the airmen from here and all the other airfields around here. And I mentioned Watersham; um, it, it's it's a focal point. And uh, we're standing here in front of a a picture, a photograph of uh, Brigadier General Frederick Castle, 4th Combat Bombardment Wing Commanding Officer, who had a key role in that 24th of December raid. Yeah, Brigadier Castle is uh, synonymous with the 8th Air Force in World War II for many, many reasons, but he's one of the founding fathers of that Air Force and and knows Hap Arnold, who commands the whole US Army Air Force at the start of the war. In fact, um, Hap Arnold was at West Point with Castle's father. And when uh, Frederick Castle was born, he was the first child born to anyone of that class uh, at West Point. So he automatically, as is traditional at the time, the whole class became his godfather. So very well connected. you know, And, he, and he's a good staff officer, but he's also a very capable field commander who flew numerous missions, which we'll talk about as we go along. But, uh, yeah, he stands out. And people might think, because he's had such a, such a strong military background, that he might uh, perhaps be lording it around a little bit. But he wasn't that kind of person at all, was he? No, no. His reputation was for being a, a soldier's soldier, and he would stop and talk to anybody, and, and he was popular with the junior ranks, the enlisted men, the ground crew and air crew alike. Uh, he was a, he led from the front, and in fact his staff quite often tried to slow him down because he worked too hard and pushed himself above and beyond the limit of that was expected of anybody. He was a great leader by example. And although he's a very capable staff officer, he also wants to be in combat. Yeah, Castle, like many of his peer group, wants to fight and wants to be involved in this, this exponential expansion of the 8th Air Force to prosecute the air war. He's he's a believer in air power. Uh, Alongside Doolittle, Eker, Spots, Hap Arnold, all these people, he's one of these guys who's just a driving force behind the US Army Air Force. And he starts off, uh, he gets promoted from Major to Lieutenant Colonel in in 43, and he's given command of the um, 94th Bomb Group, what was known as Berries Edmonds. We know it today as Ruffham Airfield, but he's posted to Berries Edmonds to command the 94th Bomb Group. And he starts to rack up combat missions in fact in December 44 he's completed 29 combat missions already and he's due his his 30th pretty soon Um, he's promoted again to command the 4th combat bombardment wing and that sees him uh, still operating from Barry's Edmonds in, 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 in his wing headquarters but he's got a number of bomb groups under his command one of which is the 487th based here in Lavenham so the 487th Mike what kind of bombardment group are they? they're uh Standard B-17 heavy bomb group. Uh, They are based here at Airfield 137 at Lavenham. They're quite successful. They they fly uh, 185 missions during the war. And they're operational from uh, 7th of May 44 through to the end of the war, almost exactly a year later uh, on the 8th of May. And during that time, they fly 185 missions. Uh, As I say, they fly with the square P. They're under Castle's command, and uh, as you know, um, and listeners will know, uh, these air commanders at the time do lead from the front, and Castle is a great example of that. And they don't always fly with the same bomb group. They, they move themselves around so that each bomb group sees them do that, so they'll, they'll do tours of inspection on the ground, they'll visit, they're involved in who's commanding and selection of those commanders. But, you know, when it comes to a big mission that's really important, they climb into a cockpit, as usually in a co-pilot seat, displace the co-pilot to somewhere else in the aircraft to assist with the running of the mission, and they're in the lead combat box leading the mission. And that's exactly where Castle wanted to be on the 24th of December, but his chief of staff wasn't keen. 
It's absolutely right. Um, um, Castle has been really busy. It's been, it's, December 44 is a tough month for the 8th, and uh, they're, they're trying to prosecute some very big raids, and the weather is really against them. And, and the Luftwaffe is also improving in its number of aircraft, etc. So the, the, the air war is becoming quite intense and it's quite tough and Castle is out in his car driving from bomb group to bomb group from airfield to airfield visiting cajoling encouraging pushing people along and he's flown a lot of missions and, and he's he's visibly exhausted and he's, his headquarters staff are quite concerned that he's flying too many missions and that uh, he shouldn't do so and that they know that there's an imminent that the Ardennes offensive has been launched and that the 8th Air Force is already carrying out missions into Germany to to try and break up and disrupt the flow of supplies to the German offensive in the Ardennes. But then they get the signal that um, there's going to be a huge mission, Mission 670, and they 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 understand that their wing and their is going to be leading that mission, which is the, going to be the largest mission ever mounted by the 8th Air Force in World War II. And they just know that Castle, if he finds out, He's going to say, I'm going to do this, I have to lead this. But they know he's at the point of exhaustion. So the, the chief of staff of the wing says to all of his staff, immediate staff, and they're in the building, when the brigadier gets back from his tour and he's been visiting various Edmonds and places like that, when he gets back, unless you're directly questioned, don't tell him anything about this mission. And he's trying to sideline him so he'll get some rest and go to sleep. Clearly, then, a man who put duty first. Yes, absolutely. And as I said, uh, his chief of staff is concerned that uh, Castle is exhausted. And his uh, chief of staff is Colonel Nick Perkins. And he's briefed all the staff, as we said. And um, Castle's out all day. He's away on the airfields. And it, it's, it's after dark when he gets back. And his driver, he has his driver drop him off at the ops room. And he comes in to see, uh, to see Perkins and said, what's going on? And for an update, etc. Obviously, he knows about the... Uh, Ardennes breakthrough because this is the night of the 23rd of December and the breakthrough starts on the 16th of December the battle's been raging all week and he he, he, uh, he realises that uh, per- he asks Perkins directly what's going on Perkins says there's, there's a maximum effort operation on we're going to throw everything we can in the sky and we've even been ordered to use training aircraft with no guns etc Ev- everything in the 8th Air Force is going to fly that day Castle is tired and uh, is happy with Perkins' plan that uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Robert D. MacDonald will, will be the combat mission commander and will lead the, uh, the wing as part of the 3rd Air Division on, on their attack the next day. And uh, he said, make sure I'm woken up, woken up and I'll, I'll see them all off in the morning. Perkins is massively relieved that uh, the exhausted uh, commander Castle has left the room and Castle sets off for his bunk in the mess and, and for a good night's sleep and he and uh, Colonel MacDonald look at each other with a bit of relief and only for a minute later for Castle to walk back into the ops room and say hey I've had a think about this this is such a big thing this is what I'm paid for I really do need to lead, lead this mission Mac so you can step down I'm going to be the mission commander and that's a mark of the man I think. So maximum effort mission. How much would Castle have known about this before it was actually announced? I think he he knows the war. He knows what's happening. The the 8th have been trying to uh, disrupt this Ardennes offensive since it started on the 16th of December. And he's been around the other, the bomb groups under his command. So he will know this is, something is coming, not when and the scale. And of course, they've been clagged in with the weather properly for for days. So nobody quite knows when and how much, who'll get into the air and how big it's going to be. So he would know there was a big, Upcoming, He walks back in, realises the scale of what's about to happen and the complexity of what's about, about to happen because there are, there are bomb groups scattered all over the UK uh, and obviously the importance. So he probably walked away, digested the information and thought, hey, I can't sit this one out. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the commander. I need to be in that lead combat box. I need to lead this mission and, and came back in and decision made and ousts McDonald from his command seat in the uh, lead aircraft of the lead box. So Castle is going to lead the wing that leads the entire 8th Air Force. What does that involve? So he, he is going to be, as you said, in, in, in the first, the front bomber of the whole formation. Let's put that in some perspective. This bomber stream on 24th of December stretches back, there and back, 300 miles. So it's it's a hell of a lot of aircraft, and it, it needs to get there. And so, and the lead aircraft will be radar equipped with the specialist radar navigator and the group navigator in that aircraft. So it, it sort of makes sense that the commander, with all that responsibility for this maximum effort raid, it needs to be he needs to be there personally to make sure that everything is done as he would want it done. It's not that he lacks any faith in in McDonald. 
it's more a case of the the wing and the groups and the squadrons under his command need to see him up front there leading the attack. So at dawn on the 24th of December, Castle drives from Bury St Edmunds to Lavenham to the airfield. Let's go and join them on the airfield, the 487th, and find out what happens. You're listening to the Mighty Eighth Podcast, podcast about the people, planes and the places of the United States Eighth Army Air Force during World War II. Mike, we've come back to Lavenham Air Base, Lavenham Airfield, where Brigadier General Frederick Castle is also arriving on the morning of the 24th of December. Yeah, so Brigadier Castle is, is as we've said, he's decided he, he must lead this, this maximum effort mission. He arrives and uh, is going to fly in a, a, B7, a modified B-17, which has uh, the latest radar technology on it, uh, with a, a radar navigator and, and also with a group navigator as the lead aircraft of the lead combat box of the, the lead wing. <laughs> he's going to lead the whole mission. Uh, he's going to lead a bomber stream which will spread out over 300 miles. Uh, so he's going to fly in treble four, which is the, uh, the tail number of the aircraft. And uh, it has no name. It's, it's, it's a fairly new B-17G. Uh, and he goes into the briefing cycle with everybody else. He will displace the co-pilot. And generally, the, uh, the routine was that the, the co-pilot would move into the tail gunner position and would uh, act as a coordinator, informing the commanding officer who's in the front of the, for the mission of what he can see, the formation, how it's holding, how people are operating. And uh, he'll do that with, with, as I said, two navigators so he has all that responsibility the whole stream is following him so mike the biggest raid of the war twenty-one thousand aircrew 2046 heavy bombers and 853 fighter planes everything that can fly will fly against the germans yeah that's right and and it sounds very simple maximum effort but what you're saying is essentially normally you would have a percentage of your aircraft on the ground being serviced, a percentage being repaired, uh, and a percentage committed to the, to the mission, and, and you'd cycle that through. Maximum effort means you forget all that. And, and also, in this instance, you, even your training aircraft and your reserve aircraft are, are thrown into the front line. So you throw everything at it, which means there's going to be a bill after that. So those, some of those aircraft will get damaged, some of them will be require servicing, so your next mission won't be as strong. You won't be able to put as many aircraft in the air. So it's a surge. So it's a, real, it's a real statement, and it's like, OK, everything must go, everything must fly. So all those crews who should have been rested, all those aircraft that needed structural repairs or needed servicing that, that are just fit to fly will fly that day. So Hitler has launched his attack, throwing everything at the Allies. The Allies are now going to throw everything that they've got back at Hitler. Yeah, and Eisenhower, he, he gripped us. He realised quite quickly early on in the, in the German offensive, while everyone else was panicking around him, that actually... We've got this. You know, all we've got to do is hang on till the weather clears and we can bring our air power back in and reinforce the Russia's patterns, third army down there, the British come in from the north in Montgomery and the, and the US First Army. He knows that in the end the Germans can't win, but air power will save lives. If if the eighth can get into the air, then that will save lives on the ground. So 2,046 heavy bombers, 853 fighters, the little friends, a 300-mile-long bomber stream. This is the largest aerial bombing formation in history. It had never been seen before, and to be honest, it's unlikely ever to be seen again. It certainly won't be seen again. There just aren't that many aircraft in the world to to do that, uh, especially from one air force. And that's when you think about what we started with, what ECA started with in, in 42. This is a really steep curve of to, to create this capability to grow this air force, as well as all the other air forces that are involved. It, it, it really is awesome because they're not all taken off from their own home airfields. Some of them, because of the bad weather on, on previous raids, have, have had to land elsewhere. So coordinating that effort, getting everyone back into their squadron, wings, groups, etc., and then into their right divisions, takes a huge planning effort. And they talk about the the field order for, for Mission 760 being a dozen of feet long in teleprinter printout or more. Uh, so, but they do it. They get it done. And it's quite an effort because the, the force is, if a takeoff is split into three separate forces, and the first force uh, is going to go out, out over Felixstowe, assemble and, and go out over Felixstowe on the coast. The second force will assemble and then go out over Clacton. And the third force will go out over Great Yarmouth. 
And as we said, uh, Lavenham had a key role in this mission. Lavenham Airfield today is actually owned by Suffolk farmer John Pawsey. I spoke to John earlier and he explained its significance. They started building the airbase here at Lavenham, the 47th Bomb Group's airbase, uh, in, in 1944, and they flew 185 missions. And my, my, uh, my grandfather, uh, David Alston, carried on farming uh, as they built the runways and actually farmed it as they were, you know, it, it, the base was operational. But um, my mother and my aunt had had a big effect on them in the way that my aunt, as soon as she could leave home, she left home and went to live in New York for the rest of her life. And my mother was constantly looking up the sky, identifying aircraft because as a young child under the age of five and she was counting the aeroplanes going in and out of the airbase. So your family continued farming while the airbase was in operation? They did. I mean the centre of it, you know, the bit around where where the runways are, then no they didn't do that but actually um, outside the perimeter track yes they did and um, certainly even the fields around the old hospital were farmed. Uh, so yes they, they let my grandfather farm as much land as he possibly could. And uh, we, we're here today there's, there's the uh, control tower which uh, you've helped restore, have been in instrumental in that tell me about that yeah, so we've actually got a fantastic tenant in there called David Good and Associates, and um, they really wanted a, uh, a an office that was in the middle of nowhere, and uh, we were able to offer them that, and they actually restored it. Uh, we charged them a very low rent for a while, but it was, it's a fantastic relationship, and they've taken on other buildings as well, and so effectively they're going around and uh, restoring them. I think, you know, the difficulty is a lot of these buildings were pulled down, and they weren't seen as important, but actually we've always valued them, and um, and and I think it's it's one of those you know things where you know it's easy to lose these buildings um but actually we will lose them for good and um i still think they look fantastic today a suffolk farmer and lavenham airfield owner john pawsey mike this maximum effort mission where was it heading so uh it's as i said it's it's left the east anglian coast they're heading via ostend and then via lease where the radar the muse radar which is call sign nuthouse has guided them onto the targets and they're they're heading for about well no they're heading for 34 uh important targets which are related to the offensive that the allied intelligence has selected for them uh and they're going to hit those over a period of days this is the This is the biggest day, the maximum effort day. And then the days following Christmas Eve, they'll carry on bombing those targets and doing what they can as best they can to disrupt the German offensive. Let's leave that 300 mile long bomber stream in the air for a moment. And Mike, let's look at what was happening back home at the air bases. Yeah, so uh, the common phrase is sweating it out. Once you see that that all all your bombers take off and leave the airfield from your, your bomb group, what do you do? Uh, I mean, you've, you, all that effort's gone into getting them into the air. Everyone in the operations room is waiting for news over the radio or, or, or from other, other agencies on the coast, etc. Um, if you're the ground crew, you've got to hang around and wait to see what's, what's happening. And uh, lots and lots of accounts talk about sweating it out. And if you're a, a medic driving an ambulance, you're sitting there waiting to see what you're going to have to do when they come back. So uh, it's, it's, an empty airfield's a funny place to be. Uh, and everyone's squinting and looking in the distance thinking are they are they going to get back and especially the weather as it is w- will they get back and we heard in previous podcasts about how different people have different ways of sweating it out of occupying the time uh, between the mission leaving and those planes returning that was certainly the case in this instance on the 24th of, of December 1944 it was Christmas there were a number of Christmas parties held uh, hosted by the Americans by the mighty eighth air force by the ground crew the people behind including here in Lavenham Yes, there were, uh, and I, I remember um, certainly when we did the research for the 381st book, it talked about the chaplain hosting those parties, and it was a big way to interact with the community. And of course, if you're a child in wartime UK, rationing is in place, but you know these guys are going to take you out for a really good party with all the chocolate and chewing gum and Coca-Cola and things you just aren't going to see on the high street in, in Lavenham Village. And earlier, Mike, you and I were lucky enough to meet uh, one of those uh, children, not a child any longer, but 85-year-old David Deacon was one of those school children at one of the parties in Lavenham on the 24th of December 1944. And this is what he told us. It was a number of parties. Um, One, uh, as far as we were concerned, is uh, the older children... Bearing in mind, children went to school till they were 15. The older children, probably sort of 
10 upwards, uh, went up the airfield. The Americans came and picked them up in trucks and they went up the airfield for a party. But uh, the younger element had a party at the school um, and uh, obviously there was presents and um, Father Christmas and general sort of activity. Um, and I've been led to believe that the commanding officer was working up to this um, big um, uh, raid that they carried out in 44, 45 uh, that Christmas and he wanted to give the the men something to do to you know, sort of distract them and also make them uh, uh, relaxed a bit. And, and that's the reason he, he organised a lot of these parties. I always remember having a little box given to me which had got various sweets in it, um, bits and pieces, chewing gum, things like that. And um, uh, it, was, it was something different because uh, they were a luxury item which wasn't readily available. I can't remember what the sweet ration was, but it was something like a quarter of a pound a week or something like that, which is not a lot of sweets. So if you've suddenly got a whole bar of chocolate to yourself, that's quite something. That's 85-year-old Lavenham resident David Deacon, a guest as a schoolboy at one of the parties hosted by the American Air Force in the village of Lavenham in 1944. So, Mike, back in the bomber stream, the maximum effort mission, General Castle, what's happening to him? So he, uh, in Trouble 4, he's at the head of the formation and lead combat box. And there's been, there, are, there have been problems. They, they left 15 minutes late. Uh, and that has also has an effect on the fighter groups. So they're due to escort them, which is the 55th fighter group from Wormingford in Essex. Uh, and they arrive late to rendezvous with the bomber stream over Belgium. Uh, unfortunately... That means that uh, Castle's 487th box and the formations just behind them are out on their own. They're out on a limb. And the Germans take the initiative. They, are, they do an unusual thing. Uh, they deploy their fighters ahead of, of the, the, the Belgian border, into Belgium, knowing that they've picked up the fact that there's no fighter escort. And uh, Castle has his own problems as well at a more immediate level. Engine number four on his, on his B-17 is playing up and lacking power. And uh, he decides about 12.25 in, in the day that uh, he's going to have to abort the mission. And he signals back that, hey, my aircraft's not going to make it. I'm going to have to abort the mission. And he turns to break formation to head back to, to England because he's, he's aborted the mission. The rest of the, the box and then subsequently the box is following, turn to follow him, thinking he's, it's a change of course. So he has to turn back with his damaged engine into the formation and just as he gets back towards the formation that's when the first Messerschmitt 109s hit this lead box and they they single out Castle's aircraft because they can see smoke coming from the engine it's a, it's a weakened aircraft so they, they, they go for it head on and they attack uh, Castle's aircraft he's got all his guns firing etc he's flying onwards with the mission he's trying to stay in formation for protection and there's no little friends there's no escort to protect them the Germans realise this and come in again for another attack. This time they hit two of Castle's other engines and um, he gives the order to, to bail out to the crew. His co-pilot says, no, I'll stay with the aircraft. Castle says, no, I'm giving you a direct order. You must bail out. And the crew start to bail out. Only five of the crew will survive. Uh, and at that point, Castle's aircraft gets hit again by the Messerschmitts and the, uh, there's a fire his oxygen system's already caught fire. Now there's a fire in one of the fuel tanks in the wing and he, he plunges down in flames. So Castle is the only man who stays with the aircraft and will, will die, obviously, and he will receive posthumously the, the uh, US Medal of Honour. Again, as we heard earlier, putting duty before anything else uh, uh, and also the safety and well-being of, of his crew. Yeah, a, a shining example of what leadership or, or heroism really is. That in itself doesn't have an effect on, on the mission overall, though, does it? No, it doesn't. Uh, although, obviously, those that witness Castle's aircraft talk about it after the war and say what a tragedy it was and how, how moved they were, but it made them more determined to prosecute the mission. Were they successful? So they do have an effect, and they hit most of the targets with some effect. Uh, and, and if nothing else, the sight of those contrails, those massed formations in the air, give the ground troops heart. They've got the ta tactical air force and the fighters hitting the German targets close in. And then to see this huge aerial armada overhead heading into Germany and, and uh, hitting the Germans where it really hurts must have been really good for the morale of the guys who were 
freezing in the snow below, fighting the Germans toe to toe. So uh, psychological and real time. So they're starting to turn the tide of the battle. They've hit the targets. They're on their way home. Well, obviously, Castle's aircraft's gone down. Everyone's seen that. The Luftwaffe is doing its best to interrupt this and. Uh, deter the the, uh, the stream but it's just too big and overwhelming and uh, al- although they'll do their best they'll only shoot down 12 uh, heavy bombers and, and 10 american fighters and the uh, eighth will claim 95 kills on the day so a bit of a one-sided match really and although it's the tragic loss of brigadier castle overshadows the day most bomb groups memoirs and, and uh, diaries recall it as a as a milk run a successful mission a mass an overwhelming mass of aircraft that could not be stopped that went in and hit the targets and the weather had cleared however they've still got to get home and the weather is again going to play a massive part because although the weather is clear over the Ardennes and they're free to 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 bomb their targets as they turn for home and come back across the channel East Anglia is almost completely obscured by low cloud and fog and it's freezing fog and a lot of the airfields are closed and they can't get back, back to their parent airfields. So we have a lot of aircraft diverted in their droves to uh, unfamiliar airfields. And there are lots of stories about uh, pat- particularly uh, Barry Edmonds, Ruffham Airfield and Ridgewell, where dozens of B-24s and B-17s are forced to divert to those airfields. And they spend Christmas Eve night, the crews spend sleeping in their aircraft in freezing conditions on the runway. So surprisingly few losses then for what was the biggest mission of the war, the biggest mission, in fact, in history, the greatest air armada the world has ever seen. Did it make a difference, though? I think it did, Johan. History says it did because, uh, as I said, psychologically, it had a massive effect on the battle. Um, To be honest, Hitler's ground offence had almost run out of steam by then and and Patton's Third Army was in place. Montgomery was coming in from the north. The front line had coalesced, so the Germans weren't gonna, were not going to achieve their objective, and they had to do that when the weather was bad. The weather had cleared. Uh, so, yes, it had made a huge difference, and more raids would follow in the days following Christmas Eve. And the legacy was, of course, that uh, Hitler had squandered what last resources he had. We talked about the roll of the dice. Well, it had come up with a one, not a six. He'd squandered those resources, and he would not stop. Uh, the Germans would then throw away the last of the Luftwaffe, on New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, on Operation Bodenplatte, where he would use every last available fighter he had to try and destroy the Allied air forces on the ground against the advice of people like Adolf Garland, who said, this is ridiculous. And as the last lifeblood of Luftwaffe was thrown away as well in the same week. So game over, really, on the Western Front. All those precious tanks, all that fuel, what was left of his well-trained troops, wasted, and they would be needed to defend on the Eastern Front and the Western Front. So really... It did make a difference, and uh, the 8th Air Force had played its part. And as I said, we mustn't forget Air Transport Command and the 9th Air Force and the RAF's number two group, except they all played a part, but that huge, overwhelming mass of heavy bombers literally made a huge impact and turned the the tide of the battle. Well, that's it uh, for this episode of the Mighty 8th Podcast, a podcast about the people, planes and the places of the United States 8th Army Air Force during World War Two, Mike, uh, a fitting end for the last podcast of the year, uh, a Christmas special, as it were. Yeah, and um, I think it's a good testimony because we talk a lot about the Battle of the Bulge and the Ardennes, and, and it, although it's, it's a huge effort by the 8th Air Force, it tends to get glossed over, so it was good to go into some detail, wasn't it? It was indeed, and and at what is a, a, a special time of year too. And I have to say, you know, since we've been doing this uh, podcast, the the response that we've had from listeners uh, on Apple, on Spotify, or wherever you get uh, your podcasts, wherever you listen to us from, has been absolutely overwhelming. And I think it's a good opportunity for us to thank everybody who who has been listening over the uh, over the past few months uh, to the Mighty Eighth Podcast. We we really really appreciate it. We do, and thank you, and Merry Christmas to everybody. Yeah, Merry Christmas, everybody. We'll be back in the new year with some more episodes of the Mighty Eighth Podcast. But for now, I'm Johan Tasker. Goodbye. And I'm Mike Peters. Goodbye.
Cool fact, a crocodile can't stick out its tongue. Also, you can get health insurance for a month or just under a year in some states. United Healthcare short term insurance plans, underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, offer flexible, budget friendly coverage for you. Learn more at uh1.com. Hey, it's Danny Pellegrino from Everything Iconic. Ready to upgrade your style game without blowing your budget? Check out Quince. They've got all the good stuff shirts and polos, activewear, and fine leather goods all at 50 to 80% less than other high-end brands. And the best part? They're all about safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing. Get that luxury vibe without the luxury price tag. Hit up quince.com slash upgrade for free shipping and 365-day returns on your next order. That's quince.com slash upgrade. 